I'm not impressed, JZ. Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Business Blaze. I am your boy The Blaze in this video. Mmm, brought to you by... But first, Bono, Barbie, and Bentleys. Craziest celebrity purchases. And my lord, if Nicolas Cage doesn't feature in this video, I'm gonna be very upset. And I just will disclaim it, like I find Nicolas Cage's spending very funny, but I'm also a massive Nicolas Cage fan. And everyone's like, Nicolas Cage, he's a bit of a weird actor, isn't he? And I'm like, he's a brilliant actor. Anyone who disagrees, shut the f up. Why are we talking about Nicolas Cage? Oh yeah, because he buys loads of crazy shit, so he should be featured in here. Also, I mean, respect. You're mad rich. Just f***ing go for it. Why not? My older brother and I are what happens here is Danny will write me a script. I will read the script. Sam will add some memes. Let's do it. Oh, I'm wearing a shirt. You see this? OGBB. It's my face with the uh, with these cool glasses on. Um, this is limited edition. You can prove you're an OGBB, but only for a short amount of time. In fact, by the time this video has come out, this might not even be for sale on the merch store at PurchTheMerch.co. So go buy. You know, if you're a celebrity, make a crazy purchase. My older brother and I are a bit like chalk and cheese, or chicken and chocolate, or apple and Microsoft, or bathtub and, to and toaster. Holy shit, Danny. Or Enron, and half reasonable accounting practices. Oh my god, I love the accounting on Enron. Well, I don't even remember what it was, but it's like, yeah, 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 we basically get to count our losses as profits, or something equally absurd. And it's like, that doesn't seem right. And they're like, no, but it is legal. And then it's like, oh yeah, this part of our business is doing really badly. Well, let's just spin it off into a separate business then and not including, <laughs> not include it. It's like, Enron, what are you doing? Oh yeah, going horribly out of business in one of the greatest corporate failures of modern times. Makes sense. And one of the many ways in which we differ is our approach to how we spend our money. These days I usually undertake at least a small dollop of consideration before committing to buying anything more expensive than a KFC family bucket. I learned long ago that bottles of wine and late night eBay browsing can prove to be a bit of a dangerous cocktail. I can remember the night I foolishly decided that my lounge was really missing a bright red four foot inflatable Dalek in the corner. No, you didn't. <laughs> a four foot's not that big. Four foot like that? that high? Actually, that would be quite notable, noticeable in a living room. My rule about purchasing shit is like, so normally it's like, oh, I really want that. I really want that. Wait two weeks, see if you still want it. And if you do, buy it. Problem solved. I mean, assuming you have the money to buy it, or save up and buy it or whatever. There are, there's so much shit I regret buying though. And my problem is I'm really bad at returning things. So it's like I'll buy something, it'll be a bit shit or not really what I want. And I just won't return it and it'll sit in the hallway. There's so many Amazon packages and shit that I just, this, it's just a disaster. When it arrived, I was initially bewildered as I had no memory of spending about a hundred quid. Jesus Christ, that is, it's inflatable. It's like basically a beach ball on this ridiculous item. And it turned out to be a bit of a, Jesus Christ, Danny, how much had you had to drink? <laughs> It turned out to be a bit of a disappointment. The ice stalk thing on top wasn't as stiff and erect as you see on TV. Well, yeah, Danny, because on TV they're not inflatable, are they? They're made by a highly skilled props department. It was more kind of limp and floppy, floppy, delivering the impression of a rather sad Dalek who could have done with a pep talk from Smiling Bob. Is Smiling Bob... Dude, this is a callback. Was Smiling Bob the guy selling penis pills in like episode six? I mean, that was a while ago. Even so, I kept the inflatable Dalek on display in my lounge for a few years, and it made an interesting conversation piece until it tragically lost its final battle with an inquisitive puppy. But my point is that these days I think more rationally, and I usually end up feeling satisfied with the long-term use that I get out of them. In contrast, my brother tends to blow a fortune on impulse, impulse purchases, which he almost instantly regrets. He often gets overtaken by feeling of nostalgia and a desire to relive his youth. I have to say, I don't know if my uncle watches this. I'll say it's extremely unlikely, so let's talk some shit about him. Um, <laughs> not really. It's actually pretty legendary. But he does, like, he does buy loads of random stuff. And it's awesome because it's like, well, you're not the one having to deal with all this random stuff that you bought. But he loves motorcycles. And he bought this thing. It's called, like, an, I think it's an MB. It's like this insane motorbike. My, my uncle's like, I guess, 60 ish. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I bought this insane motorbike. And it just goes, I mean, it must go to 60 in like half a second. It looks insane, like something you'd have on a track. And he's like, no, no, I bought it, but I'm too afraid to, to, to ride it. And I'm like, uncle, why don't you sell it? And he's like, I don't want to, I like it too much. It's like, but you never ride it. And then he bought a giant Harley Davidson because he was like, this will be more tame. And he's like, oh, it's really loud though. I'm like, uncle, why don't you sell it? And he's like, because I like it. And then he has some other BMW thing that I think he actually likes. 
but he also, we, you know, he lives in the UK, it's raining half the time, it's not great motorcycling weather. He often gets overtaken by feelings of nostalgia and a desire to relive his youth. For example, he recently spent several hundred quid on tracking down a vintage Buck Rogers pinball table, like the one we used to play when we were on our childhood holidays. I have to say, I was just thinking of a story that I wanted to tell, a little bit of a tangent here. I have a strong desire to purchase a Star Trek The Next Generation Stern pinball machine. Now, this is not like, you'd think, oh, I mean, how much could that possibly be? And there's two, there's two main considerations. One fucking price, it's about seven grand. <laughs> like, fucking hell. Or it might be like seven thousand uh, dollars, so it's like five grand. I looked him up on eBay, it was really expensive. And then you got to consider like international shipping and customs and charges and all of this bull And I'm like, I really like that. But then I found out like, you got to maintain pinball machines. Like someone's got to come around and service them. And these things are like from the 1990s. So they got to like put these things in and all of that. And I'm like, all right, yeah, I guess I'm not getting one of these, but it would be really cool. And I got this like big office. There's not, it's just a workspace right now, but I'm like, if I had a Star Trek pinball machine in there, that'd be epic. And then I'd never play it and it would just look pretty in the corner. But for seven grand, it's like, damn, son. Maybe I'd put it in the background of my video. So it would be like, yay, what's this got to do with anything? Nothing, but I spent seven grand on it. So it better can be here. Uh, that's not meant to be an indication of my age. The pinball table was considered an outdated relic when we played it in a grotty arcade hall in Skegness, but we were still mesmerized it as kids and by it as kids, and my brother was keen to get the classic game up and running in the house, despite my suggestions that it might not be quite as good as he remembered. I even traveled with him to the other side of the UK to pick it up. Oh, so he did buy it, to pick it up from the cellar, and then nearly broke my back when I helped lug it up two flights of stairs to his newly christened games room. After the initial 15 minutes of it, Excitement, which evoked a flood of golden memories from the summer holidays of yesteryear, my brother turned to me and gleefully admitted, hmm, it's a bit shit really, isn't it? <laughs> and over the years, we've had similar stories of his rash, rash purchases of boats, Jesus, goats, oh my, corner shops and fire engines. I'm genuinely not making this up. <laughs> Danny, what is your brother doing to be able to afford all this crazy stuff? I've got a boat and it's filled with goats <laughs> and I've parked it outside my shop. <laughs> but when you reach that stage in life when you, uh, where you acquire a disposable income for the first time, it can all be a bit tricky working out exactly what you're supposed to do with it all. I imagine so anyway. I don't know, just don't, I, 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 I just, I invest all my money. Like, generally, it's like I don't spend very much. I'm not like some baller ass baller. The reality is I'm never gonna buy that pinball machine because it is seven grand. I just invest all my money. Like, I don't know why. Cause it's like just one day I'm gonna be dead. <laughs> it's gonna be all this money and be like, brilliant. <laughs> well done, Simon. And the challenge is intensified when you're an uber rich celebrity in a position to make random and outlandish purchases without even making a dent in your bank balance. I suppose it's not really any of our business. If Nicolas Cage feels happy spending $150,000 on an old Superman comic, who are we to judge? I wonder if he sold that for more. Because comics are an investment, right? I mean, the right ones at the right time. And I mean, don't go invest in comics because you heard it on Business Blazer, right? I know nothing about this. I don't read comics. I don't like comics. And bearing in mind that Nicolas Cage is a strong contender for the most prolific buyer of baffling and wildly expensive items, I mean, we may well return to him in a moment. We better, Danny. <laughs> but this is Business Blaze. So let's make it our business. Bo Bono's trip to Italy. Spending nearly $1,500 on a journey from London to the province of Medina in northern Italy might not sound particularly extravagant for a rock star. Yeah, it doesn't it. That just sounds like what? First class, business class ticket? Bono's, you know, he would be flying private. Maybe he's probably, Bono definitely has his own plane, right? He's plane rich. He's the, he's the lead singer of U2. He's plain rich. Particularly when you're Bono from U2 and you're the second richest rock star in the world with an estimated wealth in the region of $700 million. Yes, he's plain rich. <laughs> Although I did hear that the average wealth of a person who owns a private jet is a billion. But he's got a plane. He's for sure got a plane. <laughs> but the curious thing about this journey on Bono's dollar is that it didn't involve Bono himself as he'd already made the trip and, he didn't, and it didn't involve a human passenger. Oh, this is Bono's hat. I know this story. The year was 2003 and Bono had arrived in Medina to take the stage with Luciano Pavarotti and friends for a charity performance to help raise money for Iraqi refugees in Iran. But shortly after Bono landed, disaster struck and it threatened to totally wreck his much anticipated guest appearance. He hadn't lost his voice or his memory or anything quite as drastic as that, thank God. I, I have to say like, I do, I mean, U2 is a great band and they're also a 
band at the same time. Because they've released some bloody fantastic music that I love. All That You Can't Leave Behind is, in my opinion, one of the greatest albums ever made. But they also made that album that got put on everyone's iPods that was an absolute turd. And I think I've told this story before, but does that so I went on a road trip somewhere, and for some reason, whenever I plugged my iPhone into the car, it would play that, like, rather than being like, oh, you want to listen to something from Spotify? It was like, no, 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 we'll use Apple Music. The only thing I have at Apple Music is that U2 album. And every time I started the car, it would decide to play that one album and that one song. So the number of times on this road trip that I heard Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara, I was like, I I'm... I'm just gonna kill myself. Don't worry, I didn't, I'm still here. No, Bono had forgotten to pack his trilby hat, and he felt like he couldn't go on stage without his signature headgear. Bono, why are you wearing a trilby hat? Don't do that. Chewing over the options available to him, Bono decided against having the hat posted to him, or just buying a replacement hat, or maybe even just combing his hair and doing without. Instead, he arranged to have it flown from the UK to Italy on a first-class seat. Ah, oh, Bono, I mean, you can't, this is just too good. Legend. The first leg of the hat's epic journey was a taxi ride from Bono's apartment to Gowick Airport, and this alone cost $150. Upon checking in at Gowick, a $700 first-class seat had been reserved for the hat's flight to Milan Airport, but the airline crew became concerned that it might get squashed or poked by its fellow passengers, so it was eventually upgraded to a safer seat in the cockpit with the pilot. Although, I don't think that's an upgrade. If I was flying first class and they were like, do you want to upgrade to the cockpit? I'd be like, the, are the chairs massive and comfortable and is there a drink service? They'd be like, no, it's the cockpit. I said move over here! Watch your steps, sweetheart. This is your first time on the cockpit, kid? Huh? I was too. <laughs> They're like really, you know, not very, you'll be seeing like the, the, the deadhead seat. I know that term from Catch Me If You Can. Like that, that hard one at the back, and be like, what, the one with the like upright back? And I'll be like, and they'll be like, yeah. That. I'd be amazed if he didn't wear it all the way to Milan. Wait, who, the pilot? Oh, uh. But a bum bum After landing at Milan Airport, the final leg of the journey was another taxi ride to Medina, costing $225, and on top of all of this, another $300 was spent on insurance and tips, making a grand total of about $1,375. You're spending $300 insuring the hat? What is going on? I mean, how much is the hat worth? Let's say it's Bono. So let's say that the hat is worth five grand. <laughs> And I mean, I'm like, that's absurd, right? I can't imagine there are any five grand hats. Why are you spending $300 insuring it? Just get a new one. It's not like insurance is going to bring it back in case of a plane crash. Apparently, the trickiest part of organizing the journey was convincing the taxi drivers and airport staff that they were just being filmed as part of some kind of secret camera TV show prank. <laughs> but the Trilby hat did eventually make it safely to Bono in time for the concert, and I'm sure it played a big part in helping raise the final tally of 2 million euros for the cause. Sadly, the rest of you 2 weren't even invited. It's pretty clear that Bono is the most important member of the Irish rock band, but the others must feel a little bit miffed that his hat probably comes a close second. I don't know, who is the other member of the of U2? <laughs> of the U2. Is it, isn't there someone like the someone? The, the hands? Fuck, it's right there! Birthday Barbie. You know you're destined to do pretty well out of life when you've become the lucky recipient of thousands of dollars worth of gifts before you've even bothered to find your way out of the womb. The baby shower for Blue Ivy Carter in late 2011 delivered an unusual lavish of uh, showering of gifts for an unborn child, including a crystal studded bathtub with a price tag of around $5,200. I have no idea who Blue Ivy Carter is. I guess we're Carter. It's got to be a celebrity because they named them Blue Ivy. No one can do that unless you're like, I don't know, some giant celebrity, because it's also bad, isn't it? What's your first name? Blue. Uh, and who's famous Carter? I think of the president. That's it. Okay, moving on. We're gonna find out. But it probably helps when your dad is Jay-Z. Oh, I've heard of Jay-Z. Now officially the world's first hip-hop billionaire. Wow. And your mum is Beyonce, whose own net worth isn't too shabby at $355 million. I have no, I, I didn't know Jay-Z was married to Beyonce, and I also didn't care. The following year to celebrate the first birthday of the daughter of one of America's wealthiest and most influential couples, Blue Ivy was treated to an even more extravagant princess-themed birthday party. The birthday cake alone cost $2,400, while a further $95,000 was thrown on pink and white roses to spruce up 
the special day. Even the guests did pretty well out of the birthday bash as the small group of VIP toddler friends crawled away with their share of the pot of accessories and toys worth about $20,000, whilst the grown-ups had to make do with goodie bags containing concert tickets and gold pens with Blue Ivy's name engraved down the side. This seems a bit tacky. Also, it doesn't seem like it's that much money. I mean, I don't want to say like a birthday party for like a hundred and something thousand dollars is cheap. It's obviously not cheap, but I've seen that TV show Entourage. And wasn't that uh, the guy, Vincent Chase, wasn't he like invited to sit on some like, uh, s like glass, uh, not glass, ice throne or whatever, just because he was a famous movie star and they paid him like a hundred grand or something. <laughs> I'm not impressed, JZ. But by far the most notable gift that Blue Ivy received from her folks on that day was a Barbie doll. For some inexplicable reason, Barbie seems to have developed into a recurring character on Business Blaze. Let's not ever mention her again, okay? Obviously, this was no ordinary Barbie, though. This wasn't your average Coca-Cola cheerleader Barbie or Spanish bullfighter Barbie. None of that bullshit. Nope, JZ and Beyonce had splashed out on a custom-made diamond-encrusted Barbie doll with a price tag of $80,000 and featured no less than 160 diamonds, along with some stylish white gold jewelry accessories. Sound stylish. It doesn't. That was sarcasm. Uh, it does make you wonder if Blue Ivy was really old enough to appreciate the expensive gesture at the time, considering that she would still have been crawling around on her knees and vomiting Play-Doh down her bib. I've got a kit, uh, and I can tell you that no. I mean, no, definitely not. My kid, you give her a gift, she's more interested in the wrapping paper. This did make me ponder a wider social dilemma, though. If you're a billionaire parent and your child gets invited to your friend's birthday party, how much are you supposed to spend on the gift? If you spend about $10, would you be accused of being a skinflint? If you buy a horrendously expensive gift, would you be guilty of overshadowing the gifts from the parents? Answers on a diamond across postcard, please. I suspect the best policy is to avoid the problem altogether by just keeping the child indoors at all time so that they can play alone with their eighty thousand dollar barbie dolls i think just buy you just just buy something normal it's not that complicated they're so rich that the gifts aren't going to matter like anything they could ever want you can get and uh speaking of buying things something that you should absolutely buy a t-shirt from the merch store Purchase the merch dot go. The Bentley Binge. I'll admit that I'm not too familiar with the name Shaquille O'Neal, despite the fact that he's apparently regarded as one of the greatest base basketball players of all time. I don't know anything about basketball. I don't know anything about Shaquille O'Neal. I think he's massive, right? Because we did a video about his shoes. Then he auctioned off one of his shoes and it was like this big. I mean, not this big, but it was large. Uh, we don't go in for basketball much in the UK. We prefer things like snooker and lawn bowls and extreme fishing. All sports is boring. Now a popular sports analyst, platinum selling rapper, reality star and actor. Jesus Christ. Platinum selling rapper? That is actually something. It's not like, yeah, yeah, I'm a rapper. Yeah, it's like, so is my mate Jock. But that doesn't mean he's actually, but when you've sold like however many platinum is, that's impressive. Uh, now commonly known as Shaq, it's worth about $400 million and seems to have coped pretty well after hanging up his basketball shoes for the last time in 2011. Yeah, bloody hell, $400 million. Pretty well, pretty well. Would you say basketball shoes or would you say boots or trainers? I have no idea. Uh, ask me one about cheese rolling. Oh, because cheese rolling is this weird sport in the U. No one cares. Weighing in at 325 pounds and standing at, s I have no idea how much that is. I guess it's really big. And standing tall at just over seven foot one inch. Jesus, that is tall. <laughs> Shaq is a gentle mountain of a, mountain of a man, as you might expect, and he requires a pretty big, big bed for a good night's sleep. Most basketball players have custom-made beds on accounts of their nosebleed-inducing height. But Shaq is probably the biggest of all. It's 15 feet long, 30 feet wide! My God! Which is several times bigger than the size of an already pretty lavish king-size bed. That is absolutely f***ing enormous! And for that finishing touch, it's got a massive f off Superman logo in the middle of it. A recurring theme in the comic fan's house. Oh my God! That is, I mean, that is f***ing epic. But when you go to a hotel, what do you do? Do you just like sleep on the floor? The rest of Shaq's mansion located just outside Orlando is quite impressive too, featuring an indoor basketball court, a screening room, 11 bedrooms, 13 bathrooms, and a quite staggering collection of vintage cars, including Porsches and Rolls Royces. His garage alone is probably bigger than most streets. I mean, it is pretty, uh, like, <laughs> respect. That's a baller ass house. You have your own basketball court. Indoor basketball court. You can do an outdoor basketball court for probably a few grand, or like tens of thousands of dollars, but indoor, that is a different game. But the story that I most enjoyed discovering about Shaq 
is the tale of why exactly he ended up buying no less than three different vintage Bentleys to add to his collection in one quick 10-minute shopping trip during the late 1990s at a cost of well over a million dollars. On a whim, Shaq had popped into a Rolls-Royce dealership in Beverly Hills and was having a good nosy at the Bentleys on display. Why would he be at a Rolls-Royce dealership looking at Bentleys? He wasn't looking particularly flashy on this day off from training, wearing simple shorts, a tank top, and a pair of cheap flip-flops. Oh, he's gonna have a bad time at Rolls-Royce, so he buys three Bentleys just out of spite. Glorious. <laughs> out of curiosity, Shaq asked the salesman how much it cost to buy a Bentley. The salesman clearly wasn't a basketball fan either. Looking Shaq up and down with a sarcastic smirk, he responded with a gentle, gently mocking, Can you afford it, sonny boy? That is such a douchebag move. Wait, what is going on? I don't understand if he's at Rolls Royce or Bentley or... I don't get it. Oh wait, so he's at a Bentley dealership. I don't know, was Rolls Royce and Bentley once the same company? Because they're not now. They're competitors. Clearly. Shaq was so outraged by the salesman's dismissive attitude that he snapped up three of the damn Bentleys on the spot just to prove that he could. Maybe the guy absolutely knew who Shaq was. <laughs> I'd just be like, it's just a sales technique. Oh, the sporting hero quickly lived to regret his rash move though. After blowing over a million dollars in 10 minutes just to make a point to an arrogant salesman, Shaq later discovered that he was far too tall to fit into the driver's seat. He should probably have just gone for one with a sunroof. That sounds safe. Ticket to the stars. I know this is meant to be about crazy purchases, but it has to be said that a ticket to outer space sounds like a pretty cool birthday gift for that difficult friend or family member. Jesus. They're coming back, Danny. It's not like you buy them a ticket to outer space and they stay there. Uh, back in 2010, one of the best-selling artists in the world today, Katy Perry, bought such a ticket for her then fiance, who just happened to be a comedian, author, and Hugo Boss baiting activist, Russell Brand. Legend. The 35th birthday gift was a $250,000 ticket aboard Virgin Galactic's maiden commercial space flight. After a few compulsory days of intensive training, Russell and his fellow passengers would jet to more than 35, 365, thousand feet into the Earth's atmosphere at a speed of three times faster than sound. The climax of the trip would involve the chance for passengers to unfasten their seatbelts and float about weightlessly for five odd minutes before the spacecraft made its return journey home. It possibly sounds like a lot of money to fork out what amounts to little more than a pissing about in air for in the air for five minutes, but these lucky ticket holders are destined to go down in history as passengers aboard mankind's very first commercial voyage into space. Other lucky ticket holders are reported to include Lady Gaga, Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, Tom Hanks, and Justin Bieber. I mean, you're gonna be in like interesting company on one of these space flights, right? <laughs> Who is apparent? Can you imagine if that crashed? You'd be like, oh my god, that's, you know, who's gonna be like the head? Tom Hanks would be the headline. Tom Hanks, for sure. Uh, he was apparently planning to shoot a music video whilst he's up there, so Richard Branson himself is also na also naturally has a reservation and has probably bagged the comfiest seat by far. However, this maiden voyage has suffered an ongoing series of setbacks and delays over the last decade, most notably the tragic crash of the experimental test vehicle VSS Enterprise. I love that they call spaceship these things Enterprise. Mwah! In 2014, in which the co-pilot was killed. It's not clear how many of these star names have experienced a change in heart over the planned trip and asked for a refund, or even if Virgin Galactic will still be the first company to achieve the dream in the face of growing competition from the likes of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. Isn't Elon Musk sending Tom Hanks to space? Uh, Tom Hanks, Tom Cruise to space to film a movie. I'm very excited about that. That's cool. Sadly, Russell Brand's marriage to Katy Perry didn't last the distance, and we don't know for sure if he even kept hold of the ticket. Katy Perry has since revealed that she hasn't spoken to Russell since he sent her a surprise text message in 2001 to announce that he was starting divorce proceedings. <laughs> Dude, that is absolutely absolutely brutal. I mean, Russell, come on, you were such a legend last time with your Hugo Boss things. I mean, but this is probably just recycled nonsense from tabloids, right? Any time I've ever been featured in the news for anything like remotely negative, well, it was once when one of my channels got hacked and it got turned into some scam and I'm like, well, f this. Uh, but then it's like the, the press I read about it was like popular top 10 channel. We reached out for comment. There was no comment. And so I didn't, I just, your emails in spam because you're a newspaper that I've never heard of and I don't care. <laughs> but it sounds so negative. Like, it's like he's got something to hide. It's like, no, I don't. F*** off, Pape. F*** news, right? Such bull So maybe she now wishes that she'd saved a few quid and gone for that discounted one-way ticket. But a bull box. Nicolas Cage. Finally. Finally. Oh, okay, good. Here's possibly one of the craziest spenders of all time. One of my earliest memories of seeing Nicolas Cage on TV and possibly the mainstream UK introduction to this eccentric character was way back in 1990 when he made a bizarre appearance on a chat show with Terry Wogan. Never one to make an understated entrance, Nicholas dramatically somersaulted his way into the studio, performed a few karate kicks, shouted woo quite a lot, and threw fistfuls of money into the audience. Did he really? I've never seen this, 
Sam, I want to see it. So put it in the video now so I can watch it when I'm watching this before we put it out. That's how lazy I am. Yes, master. Welcome, Nicholas Cage. Then during the bizarre interview, he generously handed the host a gift, but we weirdly, it was the t-shirt that Nicholas happened to be wearing at the time. This is such a legend! <laughs> Nicholas Cage was clearly setting out his stall as one wild and crazy guy, and in later years he made no secret of the fact that he liked to buy equally wild and crazy sh**. But unfortunately, his shopping sprees didn't always have a happy ending. Let's start with that Superman comic. Oh no, he didn't sell it for a profit. Did he not? Ugh. He was always a massive comics fan, who even named his son Cal Al after Superman's birth name. Nicholas once signed a contract to portray the Man of Steel in a Tim Burton film, but it sadly never happened. He still got paid, and the film was aborted, though he did eventually at least voice the character in a 2018 animated film. I mean, if you're a Superman fan, that's got to be legendary to play Superman. At one time, Nicholas owned a pretty impressive collection of rare vintage comics, and the jewel of his collection was the first issue of Action Comics from 1938, which featured the very first appearance of Superman. $150,000 might sound like a lot to pay out for an old comic, but it was in pristine condition, and it was later declared to be the best surviving example of the comic to be officially graded. I have to say, given like how much collectible stuff is worth these days, I'm like $150,000. Let's just say if someone was like, do you want to buy Action Comics number one with Superman right now? for 150 grand, I'd be like, yes, I would. I would buy that right now. I have no idea how much it is worth today. Even though it seemed to go wrong for Nick, I would purchase that right now. Let's see how I do. Would you? However, the comic was stolen from his property in 2000 and remained missing for 11 years. It eventually was discovered by chance in an abandoned storage locker in the San Fernando Valley in California. And Nicholas had the last laugh on this occasion as he later sold the comic at auction for a staggering 2.1 million pounds. Uh, dollars. Seems pretty good. I'm doing well so far. In 2007, the actor had his BDI on the auction of a dinosaur skull. Wait, why is this bad? It did really well. I don't understand what the problem is. It was so he lost it for 11 years, which sucks, but then he sold it for an absolutely massive profit. This sounds great. In 2007, the actor had his BDI on the auction of a dinosaur skull. Believed to be nearly 70 million years old, the skull belonged to a Tyrannosaurus batar, a close cousin and dining buddy of the T-Rex. And it was large and it was the largest ever dinosaur skull to be put up for auction at the time. Nicholas found himself in a bidding war with Leonardo DiCaprio, who had a habit of spending wads of cash on wacky items, but it was Nicholas who came out on top when he secured the skull for $276,000. I wouldn't buy that. I don't think that's going to go up in value. They've been around forever. This one didn't work out quite so well in the long term, though six years later it was revealed that the skull had originally been stolen from Mongolia and illegally smuggled into the US by fossil smuggler Eric Prokopi. Okay. Neither Nicholas nor the auction house were accused of any wrongdoing as they had no idea of the circumstances, but Nicholas voluntarily agreed to hand over the skull so they could be repatriated to Mongolia, where while Eric Proko Prokopi received a three-month prison sentence. Seems pretty light. Nicholas later grumpily commented, I never got my money back, so that stank. Okay, well that's not too bad. I mean, I'm glad I didn't buy the dinosaur skull. Two for two so far. Nicholas once enjoyed the benefits of 15 homes at once, including a $25 million house in California, a 3.5 spooky mansion in New Orleans, which is alleged to have housed a gruesome past, inspired the first season of American Horror Story, and is believed by some to be the most haunted house in America. That sort of thing always pushes up the price a bit. Over the years, he's also snapped up a couple of private islands in the Bahamas. Dude, that is like next level money. It's like, you could be rich, you could be rich, but when it's like islands and jets, it's like that's, you know, owning them, that's a different level. An octopus and two king cobras, a Lamborghini Miura SJSVJ, which belonged to the Shah of Iran, a Gulfstream jet, and most bizarrely of all, a collection of shrunken pygmy heads, which he had proudly on display in one of his 15 homes for years. Here's the thing though, today Nicolas Cage is worth about $25 million, which is not to be sniffed at, but it's believed that he burned through a fortune of $150 million during his heyday between 1996 and 2011, but one thing he did manage to hang on to was his tomb. In 2010, Nicholas bought a new white pyramid-shaped tombstone in St. Louis Cemetery No. 1 in New Orleans, which holds 700 burial tombs dating back to 1789. Engraved with the Latin words Omnia Abuno, which translates as everything from one, it's believed that the tomb was destined to be the final resting place of Nicholas Cage, and he's even been spotted paying a visit to it from time to time on fun days out. That is a little bit morbid, isn't it? I suppose taking a date to your own tomb makes a bit of a change from going to the cinema or having a bite to eat at Taco Bell. <laughs> 
I can't, why do we keep mentioning Taco Bell? I just can't help feeling that the White Pyramid looks a bit bland and plain and boring. I'm worried that one day in the far future an aging Nicolas Cage might try and look into this tomb with a concerned frown and mutter under his breath, hmm, it's a bit really, isn't it? But a bum This has been an episode of Business Blaze. I have been your boy with the blaze. If you would like to support this fantastic show, no. If you'd like to support this average show by supporting our fantastic sponsor, The Absolutely Banging Merch, there is a link below. You want to purchase some merch? OGBB, limited time only, with the cool glasses? Look at that. I said that already, you fucking hack. Purchase the merch.co, and thank you for watching.